Welcome to Apologetics from the Attic, the show that seeks to teach and defend the Christian faith in a post-Christian culture. And now, broadcasting from an attic in an undisclosed location somewhere outside of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, here is your host, Dave Lewis. Hey everyone, welcome to another edition of Apologetics from the Attic. Uh, I've been feeling good about pumping these things out. Um, been getting a lot of them uh, recorded, so excited about that. Thank the Lord for his providence. Uh, if you remember, if you found me on YouTube, there's also audio versions, uh, iTunes, Spotify, all the other podcast uh, networks. Please subscribe there. And we are going to continue in our work through the book of Romans. So last time we left off, we were at Romans chapter eight, and we were, let's pull this up, where did we leave off? I believe we left off at verse 13 into 14. We were talking about uh, living according to the flesh, you will die, but if by the spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. And we talked about how um, sin is not merely a spiritual reality. It's also a reality rooted in the physical bodies that we have. Um, uh, One of of my regular listeners put a comment on YouTube saying, uh, you know, sin is only a spiritual issue. And I couldn't disagree more. Um, it's sin is a holistic issue because we are body, soul, and spirit or body and spirit, depending on how you want to break that down. And the physical body has been corrupted and even the good desires, like the desire for food, sex, reproduction, um, can be twisted. And yes, of course, the root issue is spiritual. It's sin. It's the fallenness that we have from Adam and Eve. I agree with that. But the practical battle against it, according to Paul here, is the deeds of the body need to be put to death. Yes, of course, by the spirit. Okay, so let's go back to Romans chapter 8, 1 and just walk through again. Sorry, I have to recap every time, but we just need to. Now, as we get to this next part, I forgot to mention this. Um, Paul in Romans so far, the first seven chapters... The spirit is only mentioned twice in Romans two, talking about the circumcision of the heart by the spirit. And then Romans five, talking about the love of God's been poured into our heart by the Holy spirit. So that's amazing, right? That the spirit's only been mentioned uh, twice, but it's like in Romans eight, the spirit explodes onto the page. Uh, I didn't do the count but it's at least a dozen or more times in this one chapter that all of a sudden the Holy Spirit is mentioned. That's worth noting, okay? And the other thing, and I said this before a couple episodes ago in Romans, the huge typology that Paul has in Romans 8 from the Old Testament is the Exodus, and we're going to see that. The new covenant fulfillment in Christ is typologically set up by the old covenant deliverance of God's children from Egypt and their bondage to slavery and their journey through the wilderness and their, uh, their destination at the promised land. And once you see that in the background, man, it jumps off the page, man, it jumps off the page. And a lot of things Paul says that that's the context he's going back to is the Exodus event. So there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. So remember the, 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 the judicial declaration of no condemnation. And what is condemnation? Condemnation is a sentence passed. When you're condemned to death, you've sentence has been passed. Well, those who are in Christ. So where does this condemnation come from? It comes from our union with Christ. It's an important category. We are united to Christ by faith. And then Paul says, and here's where the spirit jumps in for the law of the spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. So right away we have this freedom language. What should that remind us of the Exodus event? What set my, let my people go. Moses said to Pharaoh and Pharaoh 
is the figure of sin and death. But the presence of God dwelling with his people in the burning bush and the pillar of cloud is, is the freedom, the spirit of life, the new life that was available to the Israelites in the Exodus event. So that's the contrast here. And we talked about these principles. They are two principles that battle with one another. The law, the principle of the spirit of life that's in Christ Jesus, and this principle of the law of sin and death, the principle of sin and death. Now, how does this freedom happen? For God has done what the law, weakened by the flesh, could not do. By sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and for sin he condemns sin in the flesh. We talked about this. You can go back and, and listen. Um, so the law was weak and could not accomplish what it needed to accomplish. Even in the Exodus, you will see that the law is given, but the law condemns the children of Israel. There's almost a recapitulation of the covenant of Eden, where the Israelites are brought before the mountain and they enter into a covenant with God. And then there's this amazing passage after the law is given, where it says 120 of the elders of Israel, uh, they went up on the mountain with Moses. A lot of people miss this. And it says they saw the God of Israel and they ate and drank in his presence and they were not struck down by God. There's this re-entry into God's presence that was lost at the garden. But then what happens? The Israelites break the law. They make the golden calf. And once that happens and Moses comes down, the tablets are broken. Remember, there was two sets of tablets made of the Ten Commandments, not just one. The first set was broken. And then after that breaking of the covenant, that access that these 120 men had to the presence of God is, is cut off. The same way Adam was cut off. They're cut off. Okay. And then what's introduced and it's to bring them to be able to dwell in the presence of God. It's the sacrificial system foreshadowed by the Passover lambs, blood being spilt. And then that formalized that, that sacrifice, the blood being shed to save from death in the judgment of God. Cause remember the death of the firstborn was God's 10th judgment. They were God's judgments on Egypt to be shielded from that judgment. The blood of the sacrifice had to be shed. And it was formalized in the tabernacle and eventually the temple and the priesthood and the book of Leviticus. What's the book of Leviticus about? How can God dwell in the midst of a sinful people without breaking out against them in wrath and consuming them because of their sin? Well, the answer, the book of Leviticus explains that. So, of course, Christ fulfills by taking upon himself the likeness of sinful flesh, the incarnation, he unites himself so that he, his blood shed as the Passover lamb, as Paul says in Corinthians, Christ, our Passover has been sacrificed for us that we can be saved. And the condemnation we deserve that should fall upon us fell upon him in our place. So that is what Paul's talking about here in the law um, could, there's two things the law couldn't do. Well, there's three things we talked about it, bring about repentance, bring about faith and bring about holiness. The law does all these things through the work of the son, through Christ's work, where he was condemned in our place. And why did, why did this happen? And we talked about this in order that the righteous requirement of law might be fulfilled in us who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. And we mentioned the righteous requirement of the law. I believe to take the, to take the whole teaching and not just just cram it into one thing. It the righteous requirement of the law is repentance, faith, and walking in obedience. Repentance, faith, and walking in obedience. That's what the law requires. And those of us who have been regenerated, born again, we are walking according to that. Now, are we walking according to it perfectly? No, of course not. But if you are born again. You can speak of a change, a permanent change, a radical change where the person now is a fulfilling the law. So if you define fulfilling the law simply as perfect obedience, well then, yeah, this causes you all kinds of problems in your systematic theology. But if you understand the requirement of the law is much deeper than that. The law requires brokenness for sin admitting sin, confessing sin, 
trusting in Christ and the sacrifice that he's provided and seeking to live a holy life. And that is fulfilled in us. And that's the reason why Christ came was to create for himself a holy people who walk in holiness. Perfectly no. Sin horribly, yes. We talked about, we, we quoted Westminster Confession. Four, those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who live according to the Spirit set their minds on the things of the Spirit. Now, the remember the book of Exodus. So we're going to see that where Paul places the current new covenant believer after the death, burial, resurrection, ascension, and session of Christ at the right hand, the sending of the Spirit, the creation of the church, where, where Paul locates the believer in the Exodus story is in the wilderness. And what was going on with the Israelites when they were in the wilderness? What was the battle in their mind? The battle in their mind was following the leading of the Spirit forward through the wilderness to this promised land or to do what? To return to Egypt. To return to Egypt. Believers are in the same boat. And there's always going to be a mixed multitude. Because remember, we talked about Romans 8, 5, 6, and 7. This is a, this is a, this isn't, well, a believer, you know, they have, they're 50, 50. Their mind is set on the flesh and their mind's also set on the spirit. No, Paul will be able to talk about later the battle. And like he does in Galatians 5, there's a battle within the one believer. But this you're either an unbeliever with your mind set on the flesh or you're a believer with your mind set on the spirit. So you, in other words, you're either born again or you're not. Now we can get into the doctrine of sanctification, but this is about regeneration. Paul talking about in Romans eight, five, six, and seven and eight for the mindset on the flesh is death, but the mindset on the spirit is life and peace. So the mindset on the flesh, those among the Israelites who died in the wilderness, who constantly complained and said, we want to go back to Egypt. We want to go back to the place of sin and death, of slavery and bondage, because at least we had pots of meat to eat. Right? We're not going to be content with this manna, the daily bread that God is, is providing us in the wilderness. We want to go back to where it was easy. Well, we, yeah, we were in slavery and it was terrible, but it was easier. Right? This is also the battle of the Christian life. It's much easier to just go the way of the world. It's much easier just to buy into the, what the world says is pleasurable, what the world says is right, what the world says will give you satisfaction. And it doesn't have to be just straight up, you know, open sin, like open fleshly, you know, in your face sin, like you see on television and in media and social media. It can also be more subtle than that. I, I'm just content to, uh, you know, heap for myself treasures of this world to live the American dream for the mindset of the flesh is death, but to set the mind of the spirit is life and peace for the mind that's set on the flesh is hostile to God for it does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. You, however, are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. If in fact, the spirit of God dwells in you, anyone who does not have the spirit of Christ does not belong to him. So what's the test? What's the test between someone who is the category of be having their mindset on the flesh versus those who are not? It's, is the spirit indwelling you? And if the spirit of God does dwell in you, guess what? Then you belong to Christ. But if you do not have the spirit, you do not belong to him. But if Christ is in you, although the body is dead because of sin, the spirit is life because of righteousness. Okay, so then we have, we're going we're gonna to get into this, the curse of death. This is why we're still wandering in the wilderness. We're not in the promised land. Even though the Spirit of God's been given to us, Christ has been resurrected, as we're going to see as a first fruits. Powerful imagery of the promised land. Remember when Joshua, in this 11 spies, went into the promised land to spy it out? What did they bring back with them? They brought back fruits from the promised land, the first fruits. Okay, that's Christ has entered the promised land ahead of us. That's what his resurrection is. What's the promised land for us? To have resurrected bodies and to live on a new heavens and a new earth. The entire earth will become the promised land. It's not just about a piece of real estate in the Middle East called Israel. It's about the entire world being made the promised land. Okay. 
If the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. So what's the promise? The promise is not simply this mortal body will go away and we will just die and live in a pure spiritual location and pure spiritual bliss and, and sing uh, elevation worship songs forever. Now, if you think that's boring and not worth pursuing, I don't blame you. It's sad that so many kids are not captured in their imagination by the fact that, no, we will live on this earth and we will find satisfaction in our work. We will find satisfaction in doing what God has called us to do in this world. Uh, let me read this real quick. I'm going to, uh, this might mess up my whole thing, but I want to read it. Let me see if I can find it. Uh, the eschatology in this book. I thought this guy, this book is called the Moody handbook of theology by Paul ends E N N S. Let's see. Where is eschatology 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 doc. Now this guy's dispensational. So some of you will just tune it out right away because you won't even study the other side. Uh, I feel bad for you. Um, but let's see, let's see. He has this thing where he talks about the new heavens and the new earth. Uh, a key question remains, is there continuity between the millennium and the eternal state? No, that's not the part. Restoration of earth. Um, let's see. Environment of the new earth. Wait, where's this thing? Uh, it's really good. Uh, activities on the new earth. Here it is. Listen, I like this thing. I like how he puts this. Those who are faithful in serving Christ on earth will serve him in the kingdom, the new earth, Matthew 24, 45, and 46. Uh, 25, 14, 19, 23. Moreover, there will be a number of activities in heaven which will be in continuation of our labor for Christ here on earth. Believers will be active judging and ruling, both in the millennium and in the eternal state on the new earth. Those who have suffered for Christ and endured will reign with him. Those who have left family and who are sacrificed to follow Christ will receive a greater reward. Believers will have authority over cities. Man's original commission to rule over the earth, which was forfeited through sin, will ultimately be fulfilled in the millennium and in the new earth for all eternity. Believers are promised they might reign forever and ever. What kind of service will be there be in heaven? Many conclude there will be a community between a continuity between our service on this earth and our service in the new earth. Wilbur Smith remarks in heaven, we will be permitted to finish many of those worthy tasks, which we had dreamed to do while on earth, but which neither time nor strength nor ability allowed us to achieve. Wow. Erwin Lutzer similarly comments, it may be well, it may well be that our faithfulness or unfaithfulness on earth may have repercussions throughout eternity. It's interesting. The tribulation martyrs are pictured in the intermediate heaven where they are before the throne of God and they serve him day and night in his temple. Revelation 7, 15. In this passage, serve has a sense of adoration in a similar sense in Revelation 22, 3, where his bond servants will serve him in heaven. In the other references, it is used for praise and prayer, and that will include every form of divine worship. The redeemed will serve the Lord in many different ways in glory, all of which involve worship, praise, and adoration. Activities on earth will be varied, perhaps similar to Noah and his sons when they disembarked from the ark to, to a cleansed earth. <laughs> there will be construction of homes, Isaiah 65, 21, peaceful living in new homes, Isaiah 32, 18, farming, Isaiah 30, 23, 32, 20, cultivating orchards, Isaiah 65, 21, and doubtlessly many other activities. Randy Alcorn include, concludes, will be a great community on the new earth. The gifts, skills, passions, and tasks God grants each of us will not only be for, for his glory and our good, but also for the good of our larger family. God will rejoice as we thrive together interdependently in the new earth's con con continuously creative culture. So, you know, end time stuff aside, just this vision of a new earth where you're actually going to do things like you do in this life. You're not going to float around on a cloud in a disembodied state and, and play a harp and sing worship songs forever. That's boring. Okay, the promise is he will give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit that dwells in you. Now, what's so radical about this language of Paul? Back to the Exodus. Where did the spirit of God dwell in the wilderness wanderings in Exodus? He dwelt in the midst of the tabernacle, in the midst of the people. Where does that same spirit dwell now, according to Paul? In believers. 
The amazing nature of that truth, that if you are born again, the Spirit of God, the same Spirit that in a powerful way rescued the people of God from Egypt, split the Red Sea, gave them the manna in the wilderness, split the rock to give them water, came down on fire, this same Holy Spirit dwells in us. So therefore... Brothers, we are debtors, not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh, to be a debtor. Why? What's our motivation to live according to the spirit and put to death the deeds of the body? It's because we are indebted to God, indebted to God for what? For all the great work he's done for us in and through Jesus Christ, his son. We are indebted to the Father because of the work of the Son and the work of the Holy Spirit, the triune God. The Holy Spirit is to bring to this mortal body his own presence, to dwell in us in the same way as it tabernacled with the Israelites in the wilderness. You ever felt indebted to someone? Did somebody ever do something for you that was so spectacular, that was so amazing, They came to you in a time where you really needed assistance and they assisted you. How does that make you feel toward them? It makes you feel indebted to them. You know, it makes you feel like you owe them something. We owe God everything. He not only gives us life in the first instance that he creates us and gives us life and breath and a heartbeat. We're also indebted to him as believers because of what he's done for us in Christ. And what's the warning? So we need to hear warnings. Okay, easy believism, once saved, always saved, uh, you know, that kind of, you know, non-lordship salvation misses these things. The same way that the children of Israel were in covenant with God by virtue of the promises made through Abraham carried into Moses. And that is why, why were the Israelites rescued from Egypt? Was it because of their obedience? No, it clearly says at the beginning of Exodus. God remembered the promises he made to Abraham, and that is why he rescued his people from Egypt. But what it's the same issue. First Corinthians 10, Paul talks about the, the instructions laid out for us in the Exodus story. Same thing Paul's talking about here. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the spirit, you put the death of deeds of the body, you will live. What happened to the first generation of Israelites? They died in the wilderness. Because they put their mind on fleshly desires instead of, by the Spirit, put to death the deeds of the body. Okay, that's where we got. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. Back to the Exodus story. Okay. Let my people go. Israel is my firstborn son, God says to Pharaoh through Moses in Exodus. If you are being led by the Spirit of God in the wilderness, this is important. How do you know who is the one wandering in the wilderness who is seeking the Lord, repenting of their sins, demonstrating brokenness and knowing that they deserve nothing but eternal death and hell, but they realize that they've they've sinned against God and they're trusting in the sacrifice alone, they're trusting in the blood sacrifice, and they're seeking to please God, struggling but seeking to please him versus the ones who are also upon in that same multitude, whose minds are fully set on Egypt, who would go back to Egypt in a moment if they had the chance. Well, that's the question, isn't it? And many times, and this is, this is part of the struggle of the church, the struggle of just, you know, this is a biggest struggle in the visible church versus the invisible church. How do you know who the sons of God are? How do you know those who are led by the spirit and those who are not? That's the question, right? Not as easy to answer as you think. And those who narrowly define, those who truly know the Lord in such a narrow manner, as James White, I've heard, he hasn't said this lately, but he said a lot a long time ago, you draw the circle of your orthodoxy and the things that you expect, quote unquote, true believers to do. That circle is so small, you have to stand in one foot, on one foot to be in that circle. We don't want to do that. We want to have our main plain teachings that are essential 
to believe because the Bible teaches them and compels us to believe them, to understand what those are, and also to list out what are the ethical behaviors of a true Christian and what should they be striving toward and what things should they renounce and what things should they look at and say that is wrong, that is sinful, that is wicked. We need to have those things. But pastoral care is about helping people grow slowly and gradually up into these values and up into these teachings. And it's a sad state uh, because of the internet, I think, has fueled this a lot, where we don't tolerate people not being in a state of learning and growing. Okay, they, 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 they put, God forbid you put something on Facebook or Twitter in certain groups where you don't demonstrate a full understanding of a certain doctrine and you, and you say something in error and, and the attack you will get from people. You're an idiot for posting that. You don't even know what you're talking about. Blah, 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 blah. It's crazy. Now, I want to read something. This is going to get me unsubscribed as well, but I really don't care. Um, this is the New Interpreter's Bible, Volume 10. And this has a commentary by, gun, 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 wait for it, N.T. Wright on the Book of Romans. Now, is your maturity, your Christian maturity, mine didn't used to be, I'll admit it. Uh, I thank God that he's matured me in certain ways. Is your Christian maturity enough where you can read someone like N.T. Wright, who you may have serious disagreements on certain doctrinal issues, but still recognize that his biblical scholarship is one of the greatest of our generation? And can you look at something that he's written and go, that's really good stuff. Or if he doesn't have every single do important doctrines, like the doctrine of justification, which he, he seems shaky on, on his understanding and how he processes it through. Although I've heard him say, anyway, I just want to point that out. No, who cares about that? Let's just read this. So I want to read. So, so right is the one who really is good. It's showing the Exodus narrative being the typology behind Romans 8. So let's just read. This is where he starts at verse 14, where we're at now. Let's see. Uh, those, it is, okay, here we go. The gar with which verse 14 is linked to which to what proceeds is best understood as explaining not only why this spirit led action of killing off the deeds of the body leads to life, but also the suppressed statement of that to which, or rather the one to whom Christians are indebted quote, mortification leads to life because the spirit that enables it also assures us of our divine adoption. And also we are indebted to God for being led by that spirit. We are God's children. And so God's heirs, there may also be further logical connection, depending on the scriptural context, not least the Exodus narrative. Okay. Here's a point. It is because the people were God's children that holiness was enjoined upon them. Right. The preface to the 10 commandments, right? I am the Lord, your God, who brought you out of the house, the land of Egypt, the house of bondage. Therefore, you shall have no other gods before me. Right. Many have noted that, that the Ten Commandments has a preface. It doesn't just jump into the commandments. It gives the reason why the commandments should be kept because of something God did first. Okay. So listen to this part. It is those who are, quote, led by the spirit to whom this status of divine adoption is given. The image here is taken from the wilderness wanderings of Israel, led by the pillar of cloud and fire. He gives a whole bunch of references. These symbols of God's powerful presence are here replaced, as we might have guessed from the indwelling theme in 8, 9 to 11, by the Spirit, who now does for God's people that which the tabernacling presence of God did in the wilderness, assuring them of divine adoption and leading them forward to their inheritance. The idea of Christians as God's sons and daughters is rooted in the same Exodus narrative, again, reapplied in the prophets, Exodus 4.22, Isaiah 1.2, Hosea 1.10, Hosea 11.1. 1. 
as in Galatians 4, 1 to 7, the God who sends the Son now sends the Spirit of the Son in order to adopt as sons and daughters all those in whom the Spirit dwells, or as here, still within the Exodus imagery, those who are led by the Spirit. And then he goes, yeah, we, it's... It, his, his ability to connect this to the narrative of Exodus is absolutely incredible. I'll try to do it some justice here. So, for all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons by whom we cry, Abba, Father. So once again, we as believers who trust in Christ, the Spirit of God, the spirit of adoption, it's called here, has been given to us and we receive it. So the spirit of slavery that falls back into fear, right? And says, you know what? I don't, my future, I don't trust God. I don't trust his goodness. I don't trust that he's leading me into a promised land. I want to go back to Egypt. I want to go back to where it was easy. I want to go back to where it was familiar. I want to go back to at least my earthly needs were met. Christians don't fall into that. We move forward and we trust God because he's the father, the Abba father. The daddy God, sometimes it's said, I don't like that translation, but it's, it's a term of endearance, right? This term Abba, right? It's from the Aramaic for father, okay? We, God is the good, good father, as, as Chris Tomlin said. That God is good and can be trusted, and he will give us what, as Jesus said, our what? daily bread. And what did Jesus teach? We shouldn't worry about tomorrow, worry about today and stop be having anxiety and cares about what you're going to eat and what you're going to drink and what you're going to wear and all this stuff. Build your treasures in heaven, not on earth. Okay. Because we have God giving us promises as we wander in this wilderness state. Yes, beloved, we are living in a wilderness state. This earth is filled with violence, bloodshed, hunger, disease, people hating one another. Okay. Anything can go wrong. You can die at any moment in a car accident from, from some disease, from cancer. The struggle, the battle, raising children, trying to live a godly life, trying to provide for your family, dealing with other people's issues and attitudes and, and all everything. We could go on and on and on. We are not in the promised land. We, we see Jesus who's entered the promised land ahead of us and we are trusting in him and we are following him and we are indwelt by the spirit. The spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. So what's the one most important thing according to Paul here? To know who are the ones who are indwelt by the Spirit and following the Spirit and putting to death the deeds of the body and are having the mind of the Spirit. Well, one thing, they understand that they are children of God. Are you a child of God? And what does it mean to be a child of God? And what were you before you were a child of God? You were a child of the devil. In sin. A child of wrath. A child who deserved judgment. Okay, these are the things that you teach someone as they understand and embrace the Christian faith. Understand your identity then and understand your identity now. Because you have to understand your identity then to fully appreciate your identity now. We are, we, we are children of God. The Spirit of God, if it's dwelling in you and leading you to truth, you recognize and you are grateful and you are thankful. I am a child of God. The creator of the universe sent his son to shed his blood and make me his child. And if we are children, look what it's saying, then heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ. So we have an inheritance. You want a prosperity gospel? I'll give you a prosperity gospel. In the new heavens and the new earth, we will have the same wealth as God has. We will have everything he has. And he is the owner of the entire universe, not just planet earth. 
He's the owner of every gold, silver, diamond, jewel, anything of value, anything you value, God owns it and it's his to give. Well, we sit down here and try to scrape together crap, scraps to make, get. Oh, this is my inheritance and this is mine and I'm going to pass it on. I'm going to get this. It's mine, 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 mine. We don't understand that the one we call father owns it all. Everything is his and we will inherit that. But notice the condition placed upon this. It's very interesting. Provided we suffer with him in order that we may also be glorified with him. So this sounds really good up until that second half of verse 17, doesn't it? We are heirs. We have this great inheritance coming to us. We're fellow heirs with Christ. But wait a minute. We also now see another evidence of the spirit indwelling us. That the spirit moves us to suffer. The spirit fills us not only with the joy of being a son, but also fills us with the sufferings that Christ experienced. And the pattern is to go from suffering to glory, suffering to glory. Many in the modern day of 2024 who call themselves pastors just promise the glory without the suffering. Just promise the glory without the suffering. The entire shtick that fills up the church pews is to look at, look at Christianity. Isn't it wonderful? And the pastor has to be this example of just wonderful American living. Having a suffering pastor? No. No, we're not going to, we're not going to tolerate that. We want someone who's successful. He looks good. He talks well, he dresses well, he presents himself well, not socially awkward at all, completely has it all together. We, that's our example of somebody who really is making it and doing it well, has an Instagram following. I mean, has a, has, has, has a TikTok, has his social media game is on point, on point. Instead of looking for the man or woman of God who's suffering, and that suffering produces in them desire to be glorified with Christ, to participate in Christ above the things of the world, and that's the slow, steady progress that's made day after day, week after week, month after month, year after year of following Christ in the wilderness as the Israelites did. Pray that. Pray that prayer. I'll pray it. I've prayed it before and I think I regret it. <laughs> Christ, let your sufferings pour into my life so that your glory may pour in as well. Powerful prayer. Now, Paul then riffs off of that idea of suffering and takes it here. Verse 18, for I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. So then what Paul does is he says, okay, if you're experiencing suffering, they're not even worthy to be compared with the future glory that will be revealed to us, in us, around us. Once again, the sufferings of the promised land are nothing compared to the glory, or the suffering of the wilderness, I'm sorry, is nothing to be compared with the glories of the promised land. The suffering we experience in this mortal body, subject to death and disease still, subject to sin, subject to this world, the flesh, the devil, everything going on around us, the sufferings we experience as believers are not worth comparing with the glory to be revealed. Now, for the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. So, so Exodus narrative, once again, in the background, right? The suffering of the Israelites, you know, confined to 
their bondage in Egypt, the redemption of the Passover lamb, the, the crossing of the Red Sea, the arriving at Sinai, the giving of the law, the sending of the spirit, the tabernacling presence of God, right? That suffering, that, that the, the, the sons of God are de- redeemed from Egypt and brought out into the wilderness and they're headed toward the promised land. That is given a global scale now. It's not just this one group of people, the children of Abraham. In the new covenant, this is for every tribe, tongue, and nation. This is to go into all the world. The entire world is enacting the story now, and Christ is bringing the entire world into this. We have our bondage in Egypt. That is our deadness in sin, our slavery to Satan, who is Pharaoh, and our bondage to sin and death. Christ is the new and greater Moses who God sends to free us. He he has the power to command that sin and death and the devil have to let us go, have to let my people go. We are freed by the powerful work of Christ, his own blood. Christ baptizes us into himself. That's what the Red Sea is. We are baptized into Christ. We are raised to new spiritual life with the law of God instead of being just on stone tablets on Mount Sinai is actually written on the tablets of our hearts. The spirit, instead of dwelling in a tabernacle in a tent, is dwelling inside of us. We are the temples of the living God. Our body is a temple of the Holy Spirit. Jesus is the ultimate fulfillment of that temple. He is the one who has the actual manifest presence of God because he is the son of God, the same nature as the father and the spirit. And this longing, this desire for the promised land that Israelites have, it's now transposed into our desire for a new heavens and a new earth and the very creation itself to be liberated. Let's, let's continue for the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope that the creation itself would be set free from its bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. Who subjected the Israelites to their bondage in Egypt? Who made sure that the Israelites would wind up in Egypt? God did. All, the whole scenario with Joseph and the coat of many colors and the jealousy of his brothers and all this stuff, Genesis, it's very clear, Joseph says that God is the one who sent him to Egypt. And by extension, the famine that was sent on the land, which was caused by God, was to bring the people of Egypt into that, the people of Israel into Egypt. In the same way, God's will was that the creation itself, as it says, doesn't it say this? For creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope. God subjected the creation itself, just like God subjected Israelites to be in bondage to Egypt, God subjected the creation itself to be in bondage to what? Corruption. Why? To produce hope. This, if we could get this, all the suffering that's happened in your life, all the terrible things that have happened to you, all the mistakes you've made that have caused your life to be in disasters. When you are trusting in God and you are born again and you are a child of God and you call God Abba Father, you are able to see because God works into you repentance. So you're broken over these decisions. You don't justify them and say, well, that was God's will. Okay, I can't. The, the, the anti-Calvinists are disgusting who've taken the Steve Lawson thing as a reason to just bash him and bash Calvinism. You guys are terrible. Okay, get out from behind your keyboard for five seconds in your phone and f- stop trying to find opportunities to bash Calvinists every five seconds. I just had to get that off my chest. Those who are truly children of God They don't look at their sin and go, oh, well, God ordained it anyway. Well, of course, Calvinists do. To be consistent, that's what you're going to, that's what you're, stop. 
Okay, just stop. Okay. Of course, in the flesh, you could think that. But the mind of the spirit, which will dominate a believer, it might take time for it to. There might need to be certain areas of the heart that are cultivated for it to dominate that part of their heart. That's why pastoral care is like cultivation. It doesn't grow. The fruit doesn't bear right away. But at the end of the day, the true believer will mourn over their sin. They will be thankful for the salvation that is found in Christ, and they will rejoice to receive the body and blood of Christ at the Lord's table and renew their thankfulness and their, their obligation and their, I thank you, Jesus, for dying for me and shedding your blood for me and clothing me and wrapping me in your perfect righteousness. Okay? And, and they will look with hope to the future and the promises that one day, Christ will return. And what Paul says here will be true, that the creation itself will be set free from his bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. So not only, so the whole creation will be a promised land. The entire world will become the promised land. The freedom will be complete and the corruption will be abolished. For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. And not only the creation, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for our adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. There's a lot there. And we're at 46 minutes. We'll wrap up here. So the whole creation, and then Paul shifts analogies here to, to cor- he goes from corruption to childbirth, right? So we have the pains of childbirth. And this is elsewhere in scripture. We talk about the pains of childbirth, which are awful and terrible as they're happening, but they dissipate almost completely. And the mother is able to not focus on them. And they focus on what? The birth of the child. Once that promise, that hope the mother has to hold her own baby in her arms, once that happens, everything that came before it is, yes, it was painful. Yes, it was terrible, but it fall, it fades into the background in, in light of what the hope in the, the presence of that baby in the same way, everything we're going for, cause Paul's still talking about it. The, the suffering we experience in the present are not worth comparing with the glory that we're, that's to come. Same thing. It's the same idea of the childbirth analogy. The suffering we experience will be nothing compared to the glory to come. But what, how does Paul picture the creation childbirth? I mean, if you really think about it, like the, the, the natural disasters, just the, the horrific things that happen across this planet, the unredeemed men and women who wreak havoc upon others, the sin, the selfishness, the, all this hate, everything that swirls around us. These are pains of childbirth. All of these things are driving toward the glorious freedom of the children of God that God will bring about in the future. So the more these things happen, the more we should fix our eyes where? On Christ's return and his summing up all things himself. Now, what's been going on lately, especially in the reform community? We're not fixing our mind primarily anymore on that. We are, we are, we're post-millennials now we're supposed to be, and we're preterists. So the kingdom of Christ has already arrived in 70 AD, basically. Well, I'm a partial preterist, so not all of it. Well, sorry. I still don't buy it. Sorry, I'm not a partial preterist. Um, and we need to focus our mind on political solutions. We need to have Christian nationalism. We need to start enforcing the Decalogue upon unbelievers by means of the law, especially the first table. We need to start enforcing first table. We need to elect leaders who will bring about a enforcement by jail or other mechanisms of the first table upon all 300 plus million people in the United States. Oh, and by the way, if you see someone dressed of a different skin color than you and dressed in different religious garb, that's not a missions or evangelism opportunity anymore. No, that's a, uh, that's a 
a time where you can spout off right-wing anti-immigration policy. Did you know that? That's what pastors are supposed to do now. <laughs> Joel Webin. <clears throat> That's what you're supposed to do now. I don't know if you saw that clip. It was terrible. I don't even want to get into it. Uh, the Smart Christian Channel. You should check out Joel Webin that made an appearance on them. I thought he held Joel's feet to the fire very well. And Joel, to give him credit, he's not backing down. Yeah, I'm a pastor and I'm going to spout super right-wing anti-immigration stuff. Okay? Pastors shouldn't be doing that. I'm sorry. Especially with your online platforms. Anyway. I'm sorry. We're... Where is our hope to be found? Where are we to focus it? It's not on, oh, politics will save the day. Vote Trump. Vote. You think voting for Trump is going to bring about the new heavens and the new earth? It, it's, it's just amazing. We as Christians are to be glorying in our freedom as children of God and looking to the day where, look, he, the whole creation is groaning and we are looking to what? The redemption of our bodies, our physical bodies to be redeemed at the last day. Wow. So you just sit around and do nothing? No, it's, it motivates you to push toward, as Paul says, we should pray for in first Timothy, a peaceable and quiet life we can live so that the gospel can go forth. Okay. I'm done. I'm just going to end there because we'll, we'll start at verse 24 for next time. So, and, you know, I'll put this out there. Um, I think the best way to get directly a hold of me would be uh, message me on the apologetics from the attic Facebook page, actually. Um, you know, you can leave a comment in YouTube as well. There's really no place to leave comments on podcasts. Um, but you know, you can, if you want me to cover a topic, I'd be glad to look at it. If you want to shoot me a video to review and say, Hey, can you review this guy's comments? I wonder what your opinion is. I could turn that into an episode. Um, you know, I'd like to do episodes as you guys would like me to do. If, and you know, I have, a, I have a few faithful listeners, I think, um, not that really, really this is about that. I mean, this podcast for me. I mean, since I'm not in full-time ministry anymore, it kind of scratches an itch I have to, to you know, just share uh, my Bible study, my prayer, the things, you know, I'm doing with, with an audience outside of me. Um, you know, I'm praying God's going to show me clearly if I'm supposed to do that again in a formal way, uh, you know, Bible teaching, preaching, etc. I'm kind of enjoying just taking a break from that after 17 years of in, in doing a full-time intense ministry. And just, you know, just, just relaxing a little bit. Um, but this is kind of a, something that I want to leave for posterity as well. That even just my children, as simple as that. Uh, you know, I put all this stuff on a backup hard drive, even if YouTube disappears tomorrow. Um, you know, it's still going to be there in some format where they could maybe listen to this. Um, after I'm long gone, my children, my grandchildren, etc. Um, but I want to provide content that's actually valuable too, to, that people want. So if you have any suggestions, please message me on Facebook, Facebook messenger through the apologetics from the attic Facebook page. That'll probably be the best way to get a hold of me. Um, so we'll continue with our systematic theology study. I'm thinking about starting to walk through a gospel as well. Maybe gospel of Mark and Romans at the same time. I think that would be helpful to get into some narrative portions of scripture and soaring with the gospels would be very great. So thank you again. Uh, remember you can subscribe on iTunes and Spotify and get notifications. I always post the audio. Whenever you see the YouTube go up, the audio goes up as well. And uh, you can get notified uh, on your podcast uh, platform if you are interested. So I want to thank everybody for joining us today on Apologetics from the Attic. Thank you so much for uh, tuning in and God bless you all.